You're on tune to nice up TV. Bless up yourself. Okay, cool. So uh, we're here with uh, David Katz, um, journalist, writer, uh, reggae promoter, and pushing forward um, sound system, Jamaican reggae culture all over the world. Since um, when did you first get into it? Oh, well, it goes way back, uh, it, you know, in my formative years. I was fortunate I grew up in a small town in Northern California that had very good radio. One radio station, but it was a very progressive radio station in the town I grew up in. They had this hardcore reggae show every Sunday night called Midnight Dread, three hour long. So that was, you know, late 70s coming up into the early 80s. And the music just kind of reached out and grabbed me and held on to me from there. I remember seeing uh, Jack Ruby sound system, uh, I believe it was 1982, came to San Francisco Bay Area and that was another mind-blowing experience for me. First went to London 1983 and there were a lot of sound systems happening there including the great DBC, Dread Broadcasting Corporation, which was a pirate radio station that also had a sound system, started by Rita Marley's half-brother. And again, that was, you know, these were all parts of my early reggae education. And um, when I went back to San Francisco, a friend of mine started a little music magazine and I started writing for it. One of the first things I'd written about was uh, this album that Lee Scratch Perry did called The Battle of Armageddon, Millionaire Liquidator. That was kind of the start of my journey going back, um, yeah, it's nearly 30 years ago. Oh, wicked. How, so what was, that, what was the reason that you moved to London for and can you tell me about some of your experiences living over there? Yeah, well, so this is the thing, you know, um, San Francisco, for those of you who've been there, it's a fantastic town, it's, it's a lovely place to visit, it's a great place to live, but one does have that feeling that you're on the edge of the earth, you know, you can't go any farther west, if you go a thousand miles south, you hit the Mexican border, but you go a thousand miles north, you're still uh, in the state of California, you can go three thousand miles east, and you know, you're still in America. So it felt a little isolated in some ways. And having gone there in 83, when I had like a gap year between uh, high school and university, it really opened my mind to so many different things that were happening there. And the music was a primary pull. You know, there was a very large, thriving Jamaican community there and all kinds of uh, Jamaican radio and record shops. And just it was just part of the culture. And that was part of what drew me back there. I ended up going back at the end of 86 to finish my bachelor's degree. But within three weeks of having returned to London, you know, I met Lee Scratch Perry. And he was living in London at that time? Yes, he was. And so he ended up reading the article I'd written about him in my friend's magazine, Wiring Department. And uh, what happened was, um, yeah, he thought I had an insight into his character. and. He placed a heavy burden on my shoulders about being his ghostwriter, help him ghostwrite his autobiography. Ah, uh, true. Yeah, that was a big part of how I ended up living in England full time. I spent the next two years in Scratch's company on a daily basis at his request. Anytime he had a recording session, a rehearsal, a performance, I was there. So sometimes he would summon me up to his house, this place he was living with a woman that he had a child with at that time wasn't so far from where I was living and he'd sit me down and dictate these proclamations to me what he wanted to share with the world which I was never allowed to record I had to transcribe everything by hand as he spoke it so you know this went on for a number of years and it just introduced me to a whole another world put me right in the heart of reggae happenings in London so you know um, within a few months I was meeting and interacting with and interviewing people like Family Man Barrett Dr. Alamantado, Max Romeo, you know, you name it. Everybody I was into through Scratch's orbit. It took me many, many years to actually complete this biography with Scratch. I had 10 years of rejection letters from publishers because in that time, Scratch was kind of at a low ebb in his career. He wasn't so known like now. It really took people like the Beastie Boys to boost him back up, give him that recognition he deserved. So eventually, yeah, I got a contract with a publisher. They gave me enough of an advance to get to Jamaica a couple times. I got to go and interview Lee Perry's family, 
out in the countryside where he was born, as he had told me all those years ago, if you want to know about my mother, you want to know about me, you go and ask my mother, because mother knows best. So, you know, eventually I got to go and do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's an, ama that's an amazing story. Yeah. When you were living in London um, during those years, um, what part of London were you living in? And obviously being that closely aligned with all these artists, you must have had, you must have followed a local sound system. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, well, okay, so this is the thing, this my London experience, it's just reggae is just everywhere in London. If you can't be in Jamaica, it's the next best place to be, in my view, in terms of Jamaican music. So I found myself living in an area called Kensal Rise, Northwest 10. So just two streets away from me, there was the Seven Leaves record shop. Seven Leaves was a label that reissued some Lee Perry productions in the early 80s. Some of his Black Ark, you know, there were these two great compilations called Heart of the Ark that collected vocal work from the Black Ark. And then there were two dub companion releases called Megaton Dub 1 and 2. And a few other Lee Perry material came on that label as well as Scratch's classic um, Banton record uh, called Judgment in a Babylon, the one where he talks about, you know, Chris Blackwell drinking the blood of a chicken. That all came through Seven Leaves. So that was just right at the end of my road. So, you know, again, I was in there on a daily basis. And then if you went out the door in the other direction, went a few streets away into Harleston, you had Jaw Observer, Sound System, had a record shop, so, you know, in those days, it was a little hard for me to get established as a journalist in London. People didn't know me so much as a journalist. And I started to write for an offshoot of sounds called Underground. But he would never let me write about reggae or African music, which was my other primary, you know, uh, motivator in, in terms of music journalism. He said, oh, you're coming from San Francisco, write about the post-punk scene in San Francisco, which of course, I had a lot of connections in that scene. I used to play in a band out there, but I didn't have a lot of interest in that kind of music. So little by little, eventually, I started my own little fanzine called um, Musical Root, and that was through Small Axe, uh, a journalist called Ray Herford, who did some self-published magazines and books. And um, Austin, at Jaw Observer, he used to always stock the magazine in his shop. And we used to do a little deal. He could sell it, and instead of giving me money, he could trade me stock at wholesale price. Yeah, so, cool. you know, this kind of thing. But Jaw Observer sound was stunning. He had incredible dub plates, and he had such style and finesse on the turntable. And at the Notting Hill Carnival, we all would always end up congregating at Jaw Observer at that corner of Ledbury Road and Talbot Road. At the end of Carnival, we'd all make a beeline there and spend the rest of the evening there. And then, of course, in those days, there was the mighty Josh Shaka as just the mind blower. You know, one man, one turntable, one microphone all night long. A bit like Abashanti here last night. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. And, um, yeah, similar to Abashanti, you, you always know you're going to get quality and one away individual sounds. And Shaka had that distinction as well that he had so many dub plates and incredible music from Jamaica and then he also had his own productions and other exclusive material from other producers in England. So you would get the two in one was always a great experience. You're on tune to nice up TV. Bless up yourself. And so once you became more established, you know, through Jar Observer and whatnot. When can you tell me about the first, the first books that you did of your with your own with your which you're actually yeah, yeah. credited for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how you become, um, you know, like resident in the Reggae University at Rotterdam? Sure, it's a long story, but I'll keep it brief. So basically, <laughs> little by little, did have some articles published in different magazines. Actually, the Beat magazine in Los Angeles gave me a big boost up in publishing my work early. That gave me some credibility. Eventually, I started to write for magazines like Mojo in Britain became somewhere where I was featured pretty regularly. But the breakthrough for me was, like I say, after those 10 years of rejection letters, uh, Canongate Books up in Edinburgh did recognize, they were the first publisher I approached that didn't say Lee Who, that recognized immediately, oh, a Lee Scratchberry biography, you're doing that? I said, yeah, 
and they did give me that advance, enabled me to get to Jamaica a couple times. So that book came out called um, People Funny Boy, The Genius of Lee Scratch Perry. Yeah, yeah, sure. it, was, it was first published in the year 2000 by Canongate Books. And off the back of that, I had a lot of interview material with people like you, Roy, Bunny Lee, uh, many, many different figures, Earl Chinna Smith, people that worked with Scratch, but actually also worked with a lot of other people aside from Scratch. You know, you think about a man like you, Roy, he only recorded a handful of tunes with Lee Perry, but then his, his career is so rich and so deep. So I had all this unused interview material, and I approached Bloomsbury publishers and said, I'd like to do a book of interviews you know, top 100 reggae artists interviews. And they, yeah, well they said to me, oh, you know, books of interviews don't really sell. So I said, all right, what about if I draw on these interviews and do an oral history of reggae? They said, yes, if you weave a narrative and you um, make a book around that using the interview material you have, that can work. So then they gave me another advance, enabled me to go to Jamaica several other times. Right and also to New York to get some of the people that I hadn't gotten uh, who had left Jamaica and you know, moved up to New York. So that book, Solid Foundation, An Oral History of Reggae, was first published by Bloomsbury in 2003. Now, since that time, I've revised both of those books. So the Lee Perry book had a second edition, came out in 2006 with a new chapter to bring it a little more up to date and some corrections, some of the errors. Actually, I'd re-edited the entire text, removed 30,000 words of superfluous information, tightened up the text, added about, I don't know, 8,000 words or something for the new chapter. And then with Solid Foundation, I had the good fortune to be able to revise it, add two new chapters to bring it up to the dance hall era, up to the new millennium, because the original edition cut off at Slang Tang, mid-80s. So that new edition was just published by Jawbone Press uh, just at the beginning of this year, actually. Better photos on proper photo plates, uh, a lot more information about the very early days of the music, pinpointed more succinctly. And also, about a year and a half ago, I'd had a, a small pocketbook published about Jimmy Cliff, which was part of a series called Caribbean Lives, published uh, by a small independent publisher in Oxford called Signal Books in conjunction with Macmillan's Caribbean Wing. Okay. So it's part of their series called Caribbean Lives. And what have you got in the works at the moment? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. There is another book project that I have that's pending. So it's waiting for the, the go-ahead, the green light. So can't really say what that is, but I really hope it works out. I'd love to do it. And still writing for Mojo. Uh, still writing for Rhythm Magazine in Germany, um, various other publications, including what used to be the in-flight magazine for Air Jamaica. Now, since they were taken over by Caribbean Airlines, it's the in-flight magazine for Caribbean Airlines called Caribbean Beat. And um, yeah, I had a few, uh, both the Lee Perry book and the oral history, they were translated into Japanese. I just had the good fortune to be out in Japan playing rare and unreleased re Scratch Perry music to a very appreciative audience. That was another experience for me. Still have my monthly session in Brixton, South London called Dub Me Always, where we play original vinyl style, reggae and dub. Uh, maybe every now and again something unreleased might be on a, a, a CD burner, but otherwise it's 100% vinyl. I've had some guests on that night, including Festus from Sakox and Sound was my guest there in July. Uh, I've had uh, Mr. Brown from Tighten Up Crew, Dubplate Pearl, another very good selector. Um, you know, it's a nice night. If you're in the London area, it's the second Wednesday of the month. You can find out more. Go to Facebook slash Dub Me Always. Okay, fantastic. What do you... um? What do you know about Down Under, about New Zealand and Australia, and uh, yeah, specifically about New Zealand reggae and whatnot? Well, I've seen Catch a Fire. I remember they actually played at Rototom when Rototom was in Italy, uh, so it was good to see them. My good friend Gaylene Martin was involved in promoting reggae for many years in London. She goes right the way back to the mid-70s, actually. So she'd uh, given me a few pointers about the New Zealand reggae scene. And also my friend Garth Cartwright, who wrote the book Princes Amongst Men about gypsy music, 
Uh, he lives in London. He's told me a bit about, you know, the Otorua scene. And then also, like I say, there's a good chapter about it in this book called Global Reggae that's just been published by Canoe Press, an offshoot of the University of the West Indies Press, edited by Carolyn Cooper. She's going to be launching that book this evening at our Reggae University, just in about 30 minutes from now. Ah, cool. Just over there in the Reggae University camp tent here at Rototom Sunsplash. Ah, cool. Ah, nice. And, um... What? Sorry, I remember as well receiving an, an album by Salmonella Dub yeah. a few years ago. That was another, yeah, I thought it was uh, sounded good to me. Well, what about Fat Freddy's Drop? Have you heard yeah, of Yeah, Fat Freddy's Drop as well, yeah. I remember seeing them live in London, I think at Dingwalls or one of those venues. Also, um, yeah, pretty captivating. Uh, mm. good, good to see how the music's influencing what people are creating, uh, yeah, down in New Zealand and, and elsewhere. And uh, the final question, being here at a reggae festival, which both of us kind of agree that it's maybe the biggest thing in the world, what is David Katz looking forward to or what axes have you seen that you really, really like? Yeah, so I thought Protégé on the main stage was very inspiring, part of the new, what they call the reggae revival down in Jamaica, as we were discussing earlier. Um, I thought it was really heartening to see Roy and Yvonne in the Ska Club, you know, these foundation figures still going strong. Uh, you know, Yvonne was in very good shape vocally. It was really nice to see them there. Um, I'm looking forward to Iration Steppers with um, Dig Ranka Joe and then you got a little later Digital Dubs from Rio. Looking forward to that over at the dub station. I know Her Horace Andy is going to be performing on the main stage in place of Anthony B. And it's always great to see Horace in live action. Uh, also, my friend Dr. Zapatu is going to be on the Ska Club. Uh, I think it's uh, Wednesday or Thursday night, so I'm looking forward to him. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Cha Cha from China is going to do on the showcase stage. But there's so much, that's one thing about Rototom Sunsplash. There's so much going on all the time. Even Legal Shot Sound System over here, just on the periphery. They've been playing great selections since day one. And, they, and they've got Shinehead, basically a, a resident part of their crew, like hanging out with them. Yeah, Shinehead kind of here every day doing his thing when he feels like it. It's incredible. I, don't, I can't think of any other festival where you would get that and any other festival where you would have the range that you have here. It's very inspiring and also, you know, like eight days in a row. It's really hard to beat. Cool. Well, if you tuned up to Nice Up TV, uh, we've been speaking with David Katz, journalist. Uh, out of America, living in London, and uh, thank you very much for your words today. Thank you very much, it's been my pleasure, and big up to all the regular viewers to this program. All the best. You've been watching Nice Up TV. Rewind and come again.